Welcome back, everyone. I know what you're thinking. Where's the PowerPoint? Why is there a blank screen? Well, this week's going to be a little different. Um, so this week is actually going to be much more like a graduate class. And let me explain why that is. Um, so my goal with this class is to make it so it's applicable both to those who either are in graduate training or have survived graduate training, as well as those who are undergraduates. And so up until this point, a lot of our focus has been more on, you know, what I consider undergraduate material taught in an undergraduate fashion. Uh, you have PowerPoints, you have, um, you're given the information, you're, and you're expected to be able to regurgitate it. We're shifting gears into more of a graduate level. Uh, in this week, I'm going to be teaching you skills that you'll need to actually demonstrate and um, hopefully be able to utilize in practice. Now, why am I doing this? Um, it's a great question, especially if you're an undergraduate. The reason why, as we know from the literature, um, specifically Schmidt and colleagues about a year ago did a study looking at uh, training in suicide and um, prevention and found that most um, clinicians, most psychologists, most social workers, most licensed professional counselors never receive any training on how to do a suicide assessment or how to treat suicide. So it's, is it odd to train this to undergrads a little bit? But why am I doing this? It's because I know many of you said you wanted to go on to a career where you're doing clinical work. And just by the odds, unless you happen to stay here and take a class from me, uh, you're not going to get trained in this. So this is my only shot to actually get you trained before, before you're out as a licensed provider doing your own thing, having to figure it out for yourself. So with that, the training I'm going to provide you is what I would provide to someone who is a licensed provider. And indeed, we do have licensed providers in the class. Um, if you're not a licensed provider, though, I don't want you to go out and use these skills. Wait until you're a licensed provider. So by going through this training, it doesn't authorize you to go and do a suicide assessment. That's covered by your license to practice. Uh, rather, this is to give you the skills so that when you have that license, you'll actually know how to do it and have some exposure to it. Now, I'm going to be presenting two uh, different suicide assessment measures. Uh, they're a little different. I use both of them. I think they're both very handy for different things. Um, I'm going to be prov uh, providing um, both on my courses. So if you look under the um, lecture slides where the PowerPoints normally are, uh, you'll actually find the handouts for those two um, types of assessments. So there'll be the two assessments that we'll go through and we'll talk about. And then I also am going to post a video from Dave Jobes uh, of him doing a presentation on camps. It's a very good video and typically when I actually do a class, there are some very good APA DVDs uh, of Dave Jobes doing cams, but I'm not allowed to show those online because of copyright. So with this, it's the closest I can get you to seeing Dave Jobes do cams, and that's really a valuable thing. So we're going to That'll be the third video in the set. And the fourth video for this week, so four total videos this week, um, is going to be on how to do a, a crisis plan, a suicide response plan. People call it different things. Safety plan. But essentially, after you've done your assessment and you know someone's at risk of suicide, what's the next step? So covering a lot of ground, and it's a lot of how-to. So again, this may be different than any other class you've ever taken because it's more of a graduate level. Um, just roll with it. Um, with that, I should also mention the readings are going to be extremely important this week uh, for your quiz, especially the readings from Job's book. So I know they're long. I did them last night. No, granted, I did like truly, I did all the readings last night. It is possible. Um, so I know they're long, but they're very important. So without further ado, I want to present to you the SAP. 
This is one of my favorite suicide assessments, and well, let me tell you a couple of reasons why. Um, the main thing is, is it's very simple and very intuitive. This was actually made by um, Bill Fremau, who is a, um, a professor of psychology at West Virginia University, which happens to be where I did my training. Um, I don't like it because of that. I liked it for other reasons. And his background is in forensic psychology. So when he went to create this measure, he thought, what is it that I would like to have in court if if something happened? You know, what is the assessment I'd like to walk in with uh, to make sure that I'm protected as a clinician and that I've covered all the bases? So what he did is he created this measure. Now, we've talked a little bit about odds ratios before. So what he did, um, this is for SOAP, which is an older adult version, but it's a similar idea. Um, what he ended up doing is reviewing the literature, and he looked at the different suicide risk factors, and based upon their odds ratios, put them into categories, whether it's low, medium, high, or extreme risk. So you'll notice low risk is anywhere between a 1 and a 2.9. So anywhere between 1 and just under 3 times greater risk, that's considered low. Medium is 3 to 4 and a half, or oh, almost 5. So he divides up the risk factors in this way, and that's what you see here. So you'll notice that for gender, I can select either low or medium. I can't do high or extreme because the highest it gets as far as odds ratio only um, meets this medium criteria. So why do I like this measure? Well, I, I love this measure because it covers most of your bases, um, both protective factors, which we'll get into, um, and clinical factors, stable versus acute, historical, covers all the bases. But also it does so in a way that is empirically supported. So not only are you covering the main risk factors for suicide, you're actually weighting them appropriately given how strongly each is associated with suicide. So that's really a powerful statement. Um, so not only are you making sure you're not missing anything, but your your weighting is guided by the literature. So let me kind of walk you through this because in a well, it depends when you schedule your uh, meeting with me. But all of you will be scheduling a meeting with me to do a mock suicide assessment, and you'll either be using this form or the SSF that Job's talks about and that we'll present in the next video. So with that, um, I want to run through this so you know how to do it. So obviously you can put the patient's um, information here. So gender, if it's female, low, male, medium, you know, that's pretty easy. And most of these are going to be pretty darn easy, and it was made to be easy. So if you're a male who's, you know, younger than 45, then you're low. Um, or you can see if you're older than 45, you're medium. So it, you just work through this. Um, so if you're married, you're low. If you're anything but married, you're medium. So here's where it may be a little more confusing to you. So none, so this is a mental health diagnosis. None is low. Anxiety disorders would be medium. Uh, schizophrenia, alcohol use, um, substance abuse, those will all be high. Um, major depression, bipolar disorder, borderline personality. Um, oh, I lied. So alcohol is high. Here's the other drug use, so those would also be, those would be extreme, or eating disorders. So you look at what the client's diagnoses are, and if they have any of these, then you'd mark extreme. If they have you know, any of these, you'd mark high. So whatever is the highest out of those. So if you had someone with alcohol problems and an eating disorder, it would be extreme rest. Physical illness. Um, you can see none. You go here. If you have some uh, COPD, ulcer problems, things like that, um, 
then you'd go medium, and then high would be things like MS, HIV, um, cardiac problems, things of that nature. Axis 2 disorders. Um, Axis 2 actually no longer exists with DSM-5, but they're the personality disorders. So this is just saying um, if you have a personality disorder, then you're going to mark um, you're going to mark medium. Now you'll notice one thing that's just for me. Um, I told you if they had borderline personality up here, I'd mark extreme. That's one place I deviate a little bit with the measure, just personally, because it is such high risk that I do toss it in with these. But up to you on that. If you follow the measure as it's written, if it's borderline personality, you just do moderate here. Here's where it gets a little tricky. So you notice with firearm access, it can be either none or yes, and then it could be any of these. So you have to, you know, look at these, look at the contents and assess risk appropriately. So, you know, maybe they have a firearm, but it's locked up and they don't know the combination. Well, that would probably be medium. Um, or maybe they have a firearm, but it's, you know, they don't have ammunition or something like that. Whereas maybe they have a firearm and they've been thinking of actually using it in a suicide attempt. Well, that would probably be the extreme risk. So this is up to the clinician. Um, not as clear cut, but you have to decide based on what the context is, based on what they're telling you, um, how severe you think the risk is based upon that. Recent loss, this is also the same way. So, you know, recent loss could be that, you know, well, I don't know how applicable this will be for future people that watch the video, but uh, World Cup was on last night, and the U.S. was leading with 15 seconds left, and then Portugal scored a goal to tie it. Just a heartbreaking draw. So, you know, that could be a recent loss of types, and that'd be a minor one. But this could also be losing a spouse or you know, losing your job, something much more major, which you may determine for this individual would put them at high risk. Uh, stressors. So these can be um, a lot of different things. One thing people don't often realize is that uh, both good and bad stressors are both clinically relevant. Good things are stressful too. Uh, anyone that's gone through a wedding and actually had a wedding day, will tell you good things can be very, very stressful. So stressors can be good or bad. Uh, it could be retirement. People think retirement's a great thing. And it is, but it's often tough on people. So that may be a stressor that you'd consider. A lot of stress at work, going through a divorce, things like that. Social isolation. So this is kind of going back to Joyner's idea that um, – we have a need, we have interpersonal needs. Um, we need to uh, be with others and have that belongingness. So if you have someone that's isolating themselves, then you know, depending on how bad it is, they would certainly be at higher risk. And then if they're incarcerated just by the statistics that um, at least moderate risk. So now we're going up to historical factors. Um, You'll notice so far, and this is including historical factors, these are mostly stable things. You know, some of these things are more acute. You know, they may have just happened or they come and go, but a lot of the things we talked about are stable. We get down to these acute factors in a little bit, and that's where we start looking at things that are more specific to right now. Because as you'll remember from Red's Fluid Vulnerability Model, the belief is that people are not always suicidal, that, you know, there's some ups and downs. And um, so with that, it's important to look at both the long-term risk factors as well as the shorter term. Now, it's been argued that for anything, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, which I think is true. So with that, Prior suicide attempts is one of the strongest predictors of suicide that we have. So you can see here what they have is if you've never attempted suicide before, you do low risk here. 
if you've attempted once before, uh, high risk, and then two or more is extreme risk. Number six is asking about recent planned serious suicide attempts. So with this, it's actually, you know, if you said no here, if you've never had an attempt, this would also be no. But if you've had an attempt recently that was serious, then this would be also extreme. Um, family history of attempts or deaths. So no, then low, yes, then high. And then childhood trauma, this is another one where it could be either moderate or high. It depends on, it depends on your read of things. It depends on um, how bad the trauma was, how much it affected the individual. So this is up to your clinical judgment. So now we're getting into the acute factors, the things that um, change very often. So the, we're looking at things that are currently true for the person, but it may not be true in a week or two weeks. So suicide plan and preparation. So you'll notice this one also runs the gamut, and this is a very important question. Um, so this is more than just having ideation. This is, have you actually thought of what you do to end your life? And if so, you know, how specific is it? You know, have you actually made preparations to get the items that you would need? Um, so this can be thought of as what, it's basically an index of suicide intent in my mind, um, because it's looking at how serious the person is really considering um, engaging in suicidal behavior. Uh, right below you have suicide or death, or well, just suicide, um, desire or ideation. So here it's how much, again, it, I don't love that it combines both desire and ideation um, because that kind of confounds thoughts with um, with desire. But with that, in a way, I think it's a good thing for this purpose, just because you, if anything, you're being very, very cautious with that desire. If someone really desires suicide and they've been making a plan, you're going to mark them high here and here. You'll do, you'll do extreme here, high here. So it's going to make this, you know, it's going to be conservative as far as the bias. So that's probably a good thing. Um, from a research perspective, I don't love it, but as a clinician, it probably made sense to have both desire and ideation. So if they have no ideation at all, not thinking about suicide at all here, if they've had some ideation, maybe some passing thoughts, you do here, or if there's you know more specific, more intense ideation, like, you know, I, I don't want to live anymore. I'm just, yeah, I want it all to end. Maybe some even specific thoughts on, you know, when they'd want it to end or how they'd want it to end. I go for high. Behavioral or emotional discontrol. So this is where an individual is having trouble, as you could guess from this, but controlling their behaviors or emotions. Um, their emotions may be like a roller coaster. They may be acting very impulsively. So... Again, it just depends. It's up to you as a clinician to look at them and decide how much they're struggling with um, this aspect. Same with hopelessness. I'm actually I was surprised that hopelessness didn't get extreme, but based upon their review of the literature, it didn't. But you have to gauge you know, if they feel a little hopeless about their future, I'd probably do this one. Whereas if they're very hopeless, I'd go right there. Burnsomeness, again, going back to Joyner's model, um, same deal, either medium or high, depending on how much they feel like they're a burden on other people. Agitation. Agitation is one of the strongest um, 
acute predictors of suicidality. So often when you look at people who are, are going to attempt suicide, they're very agitated right before. They may be pacing. They may be uh, very upset. Something you commonly see. So it's an important thing to pay attention to. If the person's very agitated, you want to make sure you factor that into your suicide assessment. Um, psychosis, so if the person is uh, hallucination, hallucinating, has delusions, is confused about um, what's real and what's not real, you'd mark them as high. And if the person is actively intoxicated, you'd mark them as high. Now there are also protective factors, and this is something that doesn't get enough attention. And part of the reason I picked this in the SSF is both have some me some measure of either protective factors or reasons for living. Um, we have a colleague of my own, uh, Courtney Baggy, first authored a paper that I'm on where we looked at um, reasons for living in relation to hopelessness. And what it really showed is that a lot of what predicts suicidal behavior is really not having any reasons for living, not feeling like there's any reason to go on. So with that, it's important to assess reasons for living with a suicide assessment. And if there are reasons for living, it's important to give the person credit for those. So you don't want to just look at risk factors. You want to look at protective factors as well. So again, protective factors are factors that make it less likely that an individual will engage in suicidal behavior. So maybe that they have family responsibilities. So maybe they have children they need to take care of. Maybe they have a spouse or a, a you know, parent or someone they need to take care of. So if they have responsibilities, depending on how strongly they feel that you know they are needed here, um, you do low if they feel like they really need to be here. Or a lot of, they're responsible for a lot. Medium if it's kind of in the middle. If they say no, yeah, I don't have responsibilities. My family would be fine if I'm gone. You don't have marked it as high. Religious beliefs. Now, there's a lot of research on religious beliefs, and you know, some religions being um, having higher suicide rates than others. But to keep it simple, what we have is just a simple yes/no. So. What we're looking for here, too, is this is more than just denomination. This is more as, is there anything in your religious code or in your ethical code that um, would keep you from dying by suicide? Is there anything that, you know, are you afraid you'd go to hell if you died by suicide? Things of that nature. If, if the person said, yes, if I died by suicide, I'm definitely going to hell, I'm probably going to mark that as low. If they're like, yeah, I don't know, it might... Um, yeah, I'm religious, but or I'm spiritual, but you know, it's I don't view it as a good thing, but also I don't think I'm going to hell for it if I do it. I'd probably mark it as medium. If they don't have any re religious or ethical qualms about suicide, I'm going to mark it as high. Uh, coping or problem solving skills. So you may remember in previous lectures I've said that I've kind of conceptualized suicide as a failure of problem solving. So with that, if someone has really poor problem-solving skills, they may not be able to solve the problems that they encounter, and because of that, they'll be more likely to turn to suicide as the solution. So you're assessing um, how good you think their problem-solving is. If you think they're pretty good, then you mark them low. If you think they have either none or poor problem-solving skills, you're going to go for high. And then social support, again, because you know our connection with other human beings is so important that if they have good social support, I'm going to go low. If it's, eh, it could be better, it's okay, I'm going to go medium. And if it's poor, or they don't have any social support, I'm going to go high. So now, how do you make the decision based upon this? Well, what I do is I tally up each of these. So I count up all my lows and I write them in here, mediums, highs, and extremes. And what I end up doing is I create um, a ratio for each to see what percentage of the possible lows, mediums, highs, and extremes did the person endorse. So let's say I had 14 lows. So I just divide 14 by 28 and this one's 0.5. And let's say I have, you know, two 
of the extreme. So divide 2 by 5, I get 0. 0.4. So this kind of helps guide me on just seeing out of the possible, how many times did they in, endorse each of these. Now that's not going to be, I'm not using that as a metric to decide which, what risk I give someone. I, I don't just pick the highest one. This is based upon clinical, um, your, basically your clinical opinion. So when you look at the whole assessment as a whole, you look at all the stats, um, you take everything into account, and you, can, you go with whatever you think your honest appraisal is of the person's suicide risk. So it may be that they have a couple highs uh, or extremes, but I may really believe them, you know, that they have a lot of family responsibilities, they have religious beliefs that would keep them from doing it, and, um, and they have a lot of social support that will help them get through this tough time. You know, the family's on board, they know about it, they're helping the person. Yeah, if that's the case, I'm going to rate this very differently, regardless of how these all sum out. So you have to use your clinical, you know, your clinical opinion, basically. And then here you can check the different actions you're going to take, all the way up to doing an involuntary hospitalization if you have to. Um, I think Job's really goes into great detail on managing this. So I'll leave you with him um, as far as that. Also the um, Keen book does a nice job with this. So I won't get too much into um, these different levels. But as far as what I'll ask you to do on your assignment, I'll just mainly ask you to say low, moderate, higher, extreme, how would you risk, how would you rate the suicide risk? Um, so I'll be, uh, I'll be either on the phone or on the webcam or something with you. We'll go through this whole thing, I'll, I'll role play it, and then you look at everything, much like what I described, and rate my suicide risk and tell me why, and we'll discuss that. So hopefully that helps um, give you understanding of this measure. Um, I'm going to come back with another video of the SSF, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer them, and um, see you soon.